You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show, rated the number one podcast of all time. Of all time. Make sure you're ready, because this is the podcast where you are guaranteed to learn virtually everything. Well, today's podcast is brought to you by Hover.com. Hover is domain management made simple. It is the easiest and quickest way to buy a domain name. Uh, if you've ever registered a domain, you know that companies just try to upsell you with stuff you don't need or that should be included in the, in the domain. Hover is honest. It never tries to upsell you at checkout. Everything the other guys extra charge for is included in the cost of your domain, like who is privacy and domain forwarding. And plus, Hover has the best customer support in the industry. They have a no-hold phone policy. That means if you run into a problem, you call Hover, and a real, live human being answers the phone, ladies and gentlemen. I actually get excited. It's, It's just so rare, right? So basically, it takes the hassle out of getting a domain. That is what they are selling. You just type in a few keywords you want in the search box, and it'll tell you what's available. And the cool thing is they specialize in .NET. So a lot of times you get you want something in .com or .org. It's not available. Try .NET. That is their specialty. And Hover has valet transfers. What does that mean? Well, if you've got a domain somewhere else, it'll take care of the whole process of moving the domain to Hover for you. All right. So they specialize in .NET and they now offer Google Apps. You can get Gmail, Calendar, Drive, Docs, the whole package. Uh, you got 25 gigabytes of storage. And, you know, Google's a huge company. Let's be honest. Hard to get a hold of a real person, I'm sure. But Hover has a human being that specializes in Google Apps. So if you got a business, you got a family, you got a group, you want the ability to share all kinds of stuff with, Try Hover.com. See how it works. They'll give you a 30-day free trial uh, with the Google Apps as well. So, you know, see what you think. And the best part, guess what? If you go to Hover.com slash Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, well, that's a promo code that gets you 10% off a new domain name. Oh, man, the power I have to get you 10% off. Thank you. Hover. Yeah, this is the Brian Callen Show. Wow. And you should be like, this is Hunter Moss. That's how we should start. But I should do it really quietly because I'm yeah, still yeah, in yeah. parentheses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the Brian Callen Show. And Hunter Moss. There you go. There you go. You guys like stand-up comedy? Well, go to BrianCallen.com. I'm in Houston. I'm in Calgary. I'm in Buffalo. Have you been to Buffalo? Anybody? Anybody? Uh, I've eaten their wings, but yeah. n- never. You son of a bitch. There. You silly goose. <laughs> um... Oh, then I'll be at the American Comedy Club November 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Oh, God, I never stop. The kid never stops doing stand-up, but I'm pumped because I'm going to shoot my one hour, and it's going to be hilarious. Um, <laughs> it's going to be three hours of comedy in one hour. Yeah. We're waiting for John Truby to call in. Who? I, I'm, have you read that book? No, I haven't, but you have, listen, I ordered it. Listen, if you, anybody who thinks, if anybody wants to be a writer, this is the book you got to read. Oh, look at this. we got John Truby, the man himself, Mr. Truby. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Uh, thank you for calling in. I've read your book twice. I don't know the last time I read a book twice, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I told you this is going to be an ass-kissing session. Meet my, my colleague, Hunter Motts, who uh, is a, a writer in his own right, wrote a book called The Straight A Conspiracy, you know, and he's one of the, he's an academic and, uh, and all that stuff. So yeah. this is John Truby. This is uh, Hunter Motts. John, hey, Hunter. Brian, by the way, on and off the air, is always raving about your book. So. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Well, well because I have to tell you, I, I'm, I, your book, I've read every book there is on writing. Yeah. I mean, from Stephen King on writing, from Save the Cat to Sid Field's screenplay. There is no, they're not in the area code. I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. When I read your book, I, I went, well, that's why there are so few people know how to write. And by the way, I've been in this business 20 years. I've read every script there is because yeah. I'm an actor. And and it's always kind of like, oh, boy, here it goes. And you once in a while, you read that great script. Sure. Um, and, and you have such a command of story. And not only that. You're the first person to really break down what plot means, what character is, what all of this stuff. So I've probably recommended your book to everybody, <laughs> including my father who was not a writer. I was like, you got to read this guy's book. It's on another level. Uh, you know, so, so really the question is, how the hell did you figure this out? Well, I mean, you, you really put your finger on what my intention was in writing the book because 
when I started, there were no books on how to write a good script or a, a, a good story. And so I had to figure it out by trial and error, and it took me over 10 years of making every mistake in the book. Uh, and so what I wanted to do when I wrote this book was to put down in a single place every technique that I thought was necessary for a writer to know in order to write at the professional level. Mm. And and that's the big distinction. I felt that other books that had been written that use this, this old model of the three-act structure are, are fine for when you're first beginning to write, mm-hmm. but they do not work. They're not advanced enough to allow somebody to write at the competitive level at, at, at you know at the professional level that is so competitive so yeah they were all they were always every book i would read would be sort of abstract this notion of well you got to write from a premise i don't know what the hell you're talking about right. you <laughs> right. know character drives plot okay well explain to me what character is and i would do exactly what you talked about i mean like i said and you just said i i know exactly how to write wrong I, I can tell yeah. you exactly how not to write. I, I, I practiced. I went, I went through 20 years of that, yeah. you know. So, yeah. Well, and, 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 and that's the thing. The, when people talk about writing, it, it immediately gets very ethereal, and everybody nods their head as though, yeah, we all know what you're saying, but they really don't know what they're saying because there's no, there's, it's not granted. It's not practical. Mm. And so my, my thought was uh, I've got to – express this very complex craft in the most specific and practical terms possible so that somebody can actually use it to write their own script. Yeah. I mean, the the way you describe what a character is, which is, you know, a character has a desire, and that desire could be to get the girl back, whatever it might be, but then they also have a need. Right. And, and man, I tell you, I said this to a lot of people as well. If you want to learn a lot about life, your book really is a, almost a manual for that. I mean, I'm, look, I'm 46. I'm not a naive guy. I've read a lot. You know, if you're a young guy. If I'm in college, you read Ayn Rand and you go, oh, my God, Ayn Rand is the answer <laughs> to everything. <laughs> and, and you get older and you get more – you get sobered and you get you, – you learn that there are different points of view and life is more complicated. But I have to say – your book, you know, having read it, I got just as excited as <laughs> as as when I was a teenager reading, yeah. you know, um, some sharp profile because, you know, you do learn. You you have a very deep command not only of the great stories. You obviously read everything, but th- th- I never thought of the the idea that writing a story and premise, for example is an argument for how people should behave in the world. Yeah. A protagonist and, and um, an antagonist are essentially competing. It's, it's two value systems that are competing against each other. Yeah, you know? Absolutely right. I mean, yeah. you, you've put your, your finger on a very, actually a very advanced aspect of story that most writers never get to. They think that story is all about generating as much conflict as you can between two characters, which is true up to a point. Mm. But, but conflict between two people is just a lot of noise unless they are fighting for something. And you get a contrast of values, and that's what is really meaningful for an audience, because that's when it really touches them where they live. It's how are you going to live your life? Yeah. How are you going to live a good life in this very morally complex world? And that's what great writing always does. Yeah, I mean, Brian obviously is partly approaching this from the perspective of being a screenwriter himself. And, like, that's the thing. What you've done so well is that you've gone beyond that sort of, like, abstract high level to the nitty-gritty of how do you do it. I think the thing that's obviously, you know, story is such a part of being human. Right. It's something that whether we are screenwriters or not, it's something that is relevant to all of us. And, you know, by I mean, what what do you view the function of story as? What do you think story is does for us? Why do we have such a need for it? Why is it so essential to our experience? Well, I I think there's there's really two factors. and, And it's an interesting question because it gets at the at the idea of why do people read and see thousands of stories in their lives? I mm-hmm. mean, you know, how many times do we have to read these things? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's because we never tire of them. Mm-hmm. Exactly. We never get tired it's, of them. It's because they are they are essential to what it means to be human. Mm-hmm. And uh, to me, there's there's two main things that a story is doing for somebody in terms of nourishing them at the deepest level. One is it is simply 
pleasing. The, mm. the, and, and that's really where plot comes in. Plot is what you, how you sequence the story events to get a pleasing, surprising experience for the audience. Uh, the other, though, is that it, stories are how we learn how to live life. Mm. And, um, we, you know, you can tell somebody how to live in a didactic way. You can preach to them, uh, but they're not going to take it in because human beings don't learn well that way. Mm-hmm. What they have to do is they have to see a, an example from somebody else living life mm-hmm. and see primarily from the mistakes that that they make. And really, when you look at a story, what you're looking at is for all intents and purposes, is a character going after a goal, making every mistake in the book until they finally, A, get the goal, and B, learn the deeper lesson, which is much more important than whether they actually accomplish their goal. That That's one of the things that I, you know, I remember a long time ago, um, somebody was saying that there's a statue at West Point, and um, when you walk in, the inscription at the bottom statue says, a nation defines itself on what it's willing to fight for. Mm-hmm. And my father always instilled in me the notion he was a Marine and kind of, you know, and he said, uh, a man, a person, a human being, he always said, you, you must define for yourself what you're willing to fight and maybe even die for. You know, having principles and and a moral bedrock in which you can moor into when everybody mm-hmm. else is telling you to go this way um that that seems to be and and you know another we had a guy on a podcast a wonderful professor professor robinson's a, a professor at oxford and uh, he's a sort of this academic on philosophy and he said you know he thinks freud missed the mark when he said that m- people go to war because they hate each other in fact they go to war because they're defending either a way of life that they love or they they galvanize around symbology metaphor, words, uh, um, something that they can actually kind of believe in. That becomes a much fiercer warrior, someone mm-hmm. who's fighting for, for um, an idea that they believe in. Well, exactly. And, and you look at, at any two sides in a, in a war, what, you, what they're really disagreeing is the narrative. Each side has mm-hmm. their narrative of who they are. Mm. And they feel that that is being, and that is so essential to them that when they feel that that is coming under attack, then they will actually go to war to defend that. Yeah. So I mean, it's 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 very essential to how a good story works. And and one of the the main things that I want to try to get across to writers when they read the book is that most writers understand that you're going to show a character who has some psychological flaws, and they're going to have to work through that over the course of the story. What I also wanted to show writers, though, is that even more important than dealing with those psychological flaws are dealing with the moral flaws, mm-hmm. and that really good stories climb up to that level. They they deal with the psychological, but they also explore the moral challenges that a person faces as they live their life. And if you can solve those challenges, you will live a good life. Is that it's a uh, beautiful, beautiful way of looking at it. I mean, it really makes – got to tell you, your, your philosophy and just the book itself made me feel like everything was okay in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it really I, – I mean, you know, it's, it's a little bit like I, – I almost felt like um, – that's why the book operates on sort of two levels. I think you ha- you say something that's really profound to me that I never thought about. In order to write a great story and go through the seven steps or the 21 steps or whatever it is that you know, you've got to kind of take those steps yourself. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with that as I think about it. You've got to know what you're writing about, why you are defending this. You know, we are, unless you're a sociopath, we are essentially, you know, you become a moral creature. You do have to have language for why it's best to give as opposed to take and things like that. And that, that is pretty, you know, as you think about the great stories and why they resonate with us as human beings and I'm, uh, across cultures and, and, and regardless of what your background is, it really does give you sort of pause to think uh, human beings have a very deep seated universal moral sense mm-hmm. i believe it's, yes. it, it really puts your faith in humanity don't don't you think so john i mean yeah I, I i do and i think that that it it's very important for writers to think of this moral element of story in larger than the 
the the normal terms that we talk about it normally we use religion to talk about it which is which is, which is great but but story is actually bigger than that because story takes any moral system that a person has and it can be quite vague it it it, it may not be defined in their mind very well but any moral system any way of what you think is the proper way to live, and puts it in under the test. Mm-hmm. And what you're trying to do is test that as severely as you can, because that is the only way that growth is possible. And really, when, when you look at a good story, nine, 99% of the time, you're going to see a character who is going to undergo, uh, undergo growth. Mm-hmm. And that can only happen when they are being hammered by an opponent who is hammering them to the very depths of their being, both psychologically and morally. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what Socrates did in the dialogues yes. and the symposium. I mean, that's what he would do. He would break all your walls down. You'd come to him, an eminent scholar, yeah. a great mathematician, with your, your you know, this, this scaffolding, you know, this, uh, this is my life, the, I know how to live, and he would break all your walls down. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. And leave you sort of a cowed man, but, but wiser, the, the, that much the wiser. Well, exactly. I mean, you, he, he's trying to, to get you to see the blind spots, the prejudices, the inherent weaknesses that you are living your life by. And in stories, what we always have to start off with is defining that great weakness, great flaw Mm -hmm. of the character. Mm. Most writers and the audience thinks that a story is all about, does the hero accomplish their goal? Mm -hmm. And the goal is certainly what gives you the spine of the story. But what is really being decided under the surface is how is that character going to solve that deep weakness? Because that weakness is destroying your life. How well, did you figure this stuff out? How in the world? I know you've, you've been, you're also a script doctor, aren't you? I mean, how, yeah. you, you, you do a lot of, you work on a lot of big films and stuff like that. I mean, I, I, I don't know a lot about your resume uh, in that, that turn. You've written some, some good stuff, uh, but you also have worked on a lot of movies, haven't you? That, that's my primary work is, is as a story doctor a story consultant yeah. and 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 basically they bring me in when a script has problems and say you know how can we improve the story are you allowed to say what movies you've worked on no <laughs> <laughs> i love it but I imdb it. does tell us that you were on 21 jump street I the was. tv series i was for for a season on 21 jump street and yeah. it was it was one of the uh, most intense experiences of my life yeah <laughs> but where what do you remember the seminal moment that you got you went aha this is this is the this is the craft of story writing because it's it really is amazing how uh, i just I, I don't know how you figured it out it really is i, I know you wrote a lot I, you've obviously read a lot but to be able to put it into the words you did is you know i, I hate using that word an act of genius because it's a little bit too this is getting already a little too much of an ass kissing thing here but, <laughs> but i gotta tell you I'm, I'm i really am blown away by the effort and and so th- but it's I, also I'm, I'm fascinated with how how the hell what was the seminal what i mean did you just look at yourself and what well it, it, I, I, I had one big advantage that most writers do not have, which is that I was a philosophy major in college. Aha. And what that did was give me a set of tools for how to look under the surface of any phenomenon Mm. and say, what is the process that's going on here? And that process is what's really determining everything. So, you know, I, I, I have to, you know, when I was in college, my parents said, "You know, what are you, what are you studying philosophy for? You can't use that at all." Yeah. But it turned out to be the most useful thing I've ever done in my life. Who was the philosopher that spoke to you the deepest? Uh, two of them, Nietzsche and Aristotle. Ah. And and I've I'm actually studied the poetics very carefully, and and a lot of people don't realize Aristotle was the first biologist. Right. And he understood that. All living things move through these life processes, these life steps, and using that concept, I came up with the seven steps of every great story. Oh, really? From from Aristotle? Absolutely. Yeah. And, from from and, poetics, yeah. And and it, it, even though that's not in the poetics, mm. what he talks about is first of all this this the fundamental thing that you want to look for in any story is what is the ba- the main process going on from beginning to end. Mm. And second of all, then, what I tr- tried to do, what I added to that is that process has to be determined by the character. Mm. And, beca- and, and it leads to what I believe is the most important 
single principle of all storytelling, which is that plot comes from character. Right. And what that means is, you know, you can say that and people, well, well, okay, what does that mean? What it really means is you establish the weakness of the hero, then go take them through a number of steps trying to get a goal and end with the character having a self-revelation, which means that they grow in some very deep way. That's right. So if they you're... make a decision, they make a moral decision. Exactly. And usually it's to give up what that what was their desire and in fact they they it's um it's just the ironic irony something gained something lost. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And yeah. what they what they find out is something much more valuable can be gotten if I get rid of this this desire for a goal that has been driven me all this time. That's what, the, but that's the responsibility of a human being. One of the th- things I love about reading the gr- the gr- you know Plato and, and Aristotle and you know, obviously Socrates when you say Plato, but the, 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 I and, and even the Stoics like Seneca and things like that. To me, that what was so fascinating about that is I went wow when I read that. N- not only as a young man, but later on in my life, I went there. The responsibility of a human being has been the same for thirty mm-hmm. five hundred years or five thousand years it, you know it, it, it never is lifted no matter you know you can drive a tesla and things are easier but man oh man you still are left with dealing with these issues and 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 who you really are at the end of the day right? exactly and i remember reading nietzsche i read uh the genealogy of morals and you know and i was a young i was in college and i boy that, that stuff is that's flavorful stuff man that gets you going you know well brian to give you an example i wrote my thesis on genealogy of morals <laughs> i mean that, that that to me that book is one of the five greatest books ever written unbelievable yeah and and i learned so much from that in terms of story mm. because what he talks about there is how these different moral views of the world can come into conflict and how they can evolve over time. And to me, that is a, that is a very deep idea, because up until that point, it was thought all morals are God-given and therefore absolute. Mm. And so immediately with Nietzsche, all of these things now come into play, and it becomes the responsibility of each person each writer, each storyteller, and each main character to sort out for themselves what makes a good life for me and what do I have to sacrifice to get it mm-hmm. and how have I been wrong up until this point. Mm. Well, and I think this goes back to what Brian said earlier about what he loves so much about what you said about in order for your character to go through that journey, you have to go through that journey. Right. Right, yeah. you can't you can't avoid asking those questions for yourself. But there there are so many. It's 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 also easy to distract yourself from the bigger questions, of course. And you know, mm-hmm. I mean, but that's the same. That's the age old story. But what what are the so so the genealogy of morals? Give me give me and uh, Aristotle's poetics. Give me the other. Uh, give me give me the other seminal books in your life. Well, probably the best book on story that has ever been written, greater than the poetics is uh, uh, a Canadian uh, philosopher and critic by the name of Northrop Fry called The Anatomy of Criticism. Mm. And he, I, uh, I, I first, uh, when I was in I was a sophomore in high school, I had this amazing literature teacher who, I mean, this is really advanced stuff, and he was teaching us this, you know, when we're 15 years old. And what he what he basically goes through is the... Uh, the theory of the hero and the different kinds of heroes that can drive stories. And because the main character is the single most important element in any story, this was just mind-blowing to me. Mm. And it's still, it's, it's very complicated reading. Uh, it's very, you know, advanced philosophical s- sorts of things, which one of the things I try to do in my book is to is to take some of those ideas and make them uh, again, practical for writers, so they could actually apply them. Yeah. But but his work on on what's his hero, name? What's his name again? Northrop Fry. Northrop Fry. F R Y E. I've known the name. I've heard yeah. the name. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant book. Um, mm. And uh, an, another great book that's really especially valuable if you're working in the area of film or television is a book called The Poetics of Space by a, uh, a French writer named Gaston Bachelard. Um, these, are, these are all you know, very theoretical, uh, philosophical books, but they, again, 
people people in the modern day don't really understand what philosophy can do for you in the sense of allowing you to see under the surface of things to see how a system actually works well it's funny because i i've been i've done <laughs> this uh edward uh, uh what's his name uh robinson um i can't believe i'm forgetting his name dan uh, robinson. dan robinson who's he he has a, a course 60 lectures on the great ideas of philosophy oh really at, at the, oh yeah at the, the, the teaching company it's called the great courses and he's a uh, professor at um not only oxford but also georgetown and he's now 76 years old we had him on the podcast and, wow great uh, man i went through those those 60 lectures <laughs> twice and i gotta tell you it's just it really is i always say to people i say you, you know young people say what what should i read i say well start with philosophy man start yeah. start with the greeks and, yeah. and and then work your way up you know um, and and you're you're proving that point to me. And I, I've never even heard of the poetics of space and the anatomy of criticism. You can bet your ass. <laughs> if John Truby, if John Truby recommends it, I'm all over it. I'm all over it. I, yeah. I think you. I think you'd be happy you take a look at it. It's it's uh, they're just brilliant, brilliant books. Yeah, I, I'm I'm obsessed with writing. I just I you know I have some friends that are successful and very good writers, and and I've just never. I knew there was a secret. I just knew. Yeah. That there was, and of course, the ones that I admire spent a long time writing. Yeah, I mean, they they studied the craft in co- in good schools and and with good teachers, and and that really is what it takes because so many people, and I, and I'll, I'll tell you, I had an idea, but so many people think they can write, including my dentist who has a screenplay. <laughs> and, and, and but it's you, a really good screenplay. It's a damn good screenplay <laughs> about teeth. But you, you, you pick up this, the, and you can read the first three pages, and as you well know, better than anybody, you're just like, well, here goes, here goes, can't, can't, I just can't do it anymore. Yeah. I, I tell yeah. people, I go, I'm going to read, the, I'll read ten pages of your script, that's it. And if I don't like it, I'm not going to, I just, because I, I have a feeling you're going to be making the same mistakes. Mm-hmm. Most people think because they've seen a lot of movies, right. that they can write a movie. Yeah. Uh, and and then it becomes very derivative. It's a little bit like saying, I love music, so now I'm going to conduct a symphony. It's, j- it's every bit as complicated, isn't it, to write a, a great story? Well, w- what I always tell people is, especially when it comes to Hollywood, they think, well, it's all about who you know. <laughs> and I, I always tell them that is the greatest misconception in screenwriting. Is it ever? But it's a very pleasing misconception because then your failure is not really about the, the quality of yeah. your work. It's Absolutely. about the yeah. system. Yeah. But what I always tell people is, 99.9% of writers, when they finally meet somebody who could actually help them as a good connection, mm. they don't have the story skills necessary to make that connection pay off. Yeah. That's because right. you only get one shot. That's right. So what I always tell people is, this is a craft. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm often asked, well, how can you teach screenwriting? How can you teach this? This is an art. Well, it is an art, but I don't teach the art of screenwriting. I teach the craft of screen, screenwriting. Mm-hmm. And that can be learned. And there are hundreds and hundreds of techniques that a writer has to know, to have to have under their belt in order to produce professional material, not just once, but every time out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I... I I always tell people, look, this is the most complex craft in the world. That's the bad news. The good news is you can learn every one of those techniques if, if first of all, you are made aware of what they are, mm-hmm. which is why mm-hmm. I wrote the book. Yep. And second of all, if you go ahead and practice them. But yeah. it's not going to come because I see a lot of movies or I read a lot of books or I read a lot of scripts. Um, and you know, I have an idea that's really similar to the a movie I saw six months ago. It won't don't, work that way. Don't you think? Uh, I was thinking about this idea of just you know, there's so many people who are good writers who can't get their scripts ready. Even most people don't take the time to read it. I almost wanted to create an agency that rated scripts the way you rate, you know, the way you rate wine or or a, yeah. or, a, or a restaurant. Um, but the problem was the, the ethical issue I had was if I create something, say, called script score or whatever, yeah. and um, I have a service where I get, you know, let's say 50 readers who are qualified to read your script, and you could probably do it where you get, like, students from all over the world to read your script somehow, you know. Right. Um, the problem with that is that most people would be the, that would be paying me would be people who are bad writers to begin with, and 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 you know <laughs> they they wouldn't even they wouldn't even merit a score. So I'd be taking their hundred some odd dollars, and you know most of the time knowing that this is going to be complete shit. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it, it is a real moral problem, and it's it's why I certainly have never done that either because. Yeah. And it's also why I'm really down on these pitch festivals that 
that mm-hmm. writers go to because they are they're given the promise that well you can come in and pitch to an executive and and you know if it's a good if it's a good pitch you'll get a deal well that's not going to happen you know you're going to pay money to go be, be allowed to make a pitch and first of all almost nobody now makes deals based on pitch even the best writers in town because there's no money for it right. mm-hmm. but 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 second of all unless you've got credits as long as my arm of scripts that have been made nobody is going to take your idea seriously it's got to be on the page it's, it's got to be, be in it's got to be it's got to be executed i mean yeah. right. you know i just pitched a show with uh, my friend uh, to direct TV. They loved it. They were all over it. Didn't pay us a dime. Go and write it. Now go write it. You and, know? and Brian, that is exactly, I always tell writers this. When you go into a pitch, you can make the best pitch in the world, and I guarantee you, you will always get the same response. Yeah. That is a great idea. Go write the script, and I want to be the first person you send the script to. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly <laughs> Every it. time, that's what they say. And they should say that. That's right. right. And they should say that. That's right. But we are living now in really some some amazing writers out there, especially in TV. Yeah. I mean, I, I just finished watching all the Breaking Bads. I watched yeah. The Wire. Um, you, you, they're, they're a homeland. There's some, there are some really – how do you explain that? What, what is going on here? Is it, I mean, we really are living in the golden age of TV. Well, I mean, I, I, I've been writing about this for, for years now, saying that the writing on TV is far superior to the writing in film, mm. uh, and it's not even close. Um, and in fact, I'm, I'm in the process of writing an article for Emmy Magazine on the revolution in TV story, mm-hmm. because what's what's happened here is that television has come into its own as an art form, hmm. wow. and 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 it's only happened in the last ten years. And what you're getting are these shows that are the best television we've ever seen. They're so good. I, I go around the world giving story classes. The only thing they want to talk about, they don't want to know about how to write the latest superhero movie. Mm. They want to know how do you write American TV drama? Yeah, because mm, it's yeah. so it's so good, and it and it mostly comes from the fact that there was a, a little over ten years ago a huge shift from what was known as a standalone show that like you'd get in a cop show where you you have a problem in the opening scene and they solve the case at the in the last scene mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and then they would repeat that 22 to 24 times a season right <laughs> okay so that you know that's fun but it's it's fairly low level writing and it's limited to what you can do really. exactly yeah. totally limited yeah well as soon as they went from standalone to the serial form where you had problems that were extending over multiple episodes and multiple seasons mm-hmm. and you had all these of all these characters that you could interweave, all of a sudden TV took off. And, you know, you get shows like Breaking Bad and Mad Men and Sopranos, which really started it. Um, you, you get uh, Game what, of Thrones. What, what, was, what was David Chase's background? Yeah, he did start it. I mean, I remember, I remember when The Sopranos was, there was a kid in my acting class who was, uh, uh, who was working on The Sopranos, and we were like, well, it's this new show, you yeah. know? And, and what, how did he... Uh, what was his deal? Was he a scriptwriter? Uh, he he had worked in, and I don't have his TV credits in front of me, but uh, he had done uh, some some shows before. Mm. But I think this was the first time, and it, it's because it was for an HBO. It's, it's it was really this would not have happened on network television. Right. Well, I remember doing Oz. I did the second season of Oz. Ah, right. And Tom Fontana was just so amazed when he had a meeting because I'd come off the show Mad TV and he used to watch it. So he has a meeting with me and he said he had just done Homicide. And right. and then he said to me, he said, you know, I'm just blown away by what HBO is letting me get away with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, that, that's, that was sort of like maybe I think it was the HBO model that started yeah. the whole thing, wasn't it? Well, well, well you know, and, and a lot of people were blinded by that initially because they thought, well, what HBO is letting us get away with is all this sex and violence, which is true. They were. But what was really revolutionary at the change television is what they were letting them get away with in story terms. Right. And and this this you could not even on a show like Homicide was one of the best network shows that were ever, was ever done. You you could not do that kind of storytelling the right. way you can do on you know any cable 
a channel, especially in HBO or, or a Showtime. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I often talk about uh, um, The Good Wife, which is the best written network show. And I always say, look, what those people are doing is phenomenal because what their task is so much harder than these guys writing Breaking Bad and Game of Thrones are doing because they've got to do 22 to 24 episodes a season on network. So difficult. It's so difficult. So many restrictions, so many notes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yet they're, they're putting out material that is every bit as good as these other great shows. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I love I love it. Having been in TV so long, just watching sort of the the dinosaur structure that is the sort of big three networks. Yeah. You know, it seems to work for CBS in in, in its own way. Um, you know, but but for the most part, man, I, you, you know, it's such a breath of fresh air. This we it's so fun to see what these mavericks and cable are doing. Yeah, you know? well, and and you know, a thing like CBS, um, they're the top network. It's because. They make almost exclusively the most popular genre in worldwide television. Everywhere in the world that makes television, mm. the most popular genre is cop shows. And, <laughs> and that's why, you know, CBS is, is known as the crime broadcasting system. Huh. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. What about the sitcom? Why, why, why the sitcom? Why is the sitcom still, why is it dying and why is it dead? And I know it'll come back eventually, maybe, but what, what is going on with that, do you think? Well, you, you teach a sitcom course, by I the do. way, which, and I, which it, is and great. It, and it's a, and it's a, it's one of the great questions of of story in our time because the sitcom form, I believe, had its biggest revolution in the '90s with Seinfeld. Mm. Seinfeld revolutionized how both character and plot worked in sitcom, and the. The effects of it were huge, including, I believe, making it more possible for Sopranos to exist. Because really? they were the first ones to, sit, to, to break the network view that uh, you have to have, quote, likable characters. They, they were for, by many standards, unlikable people because they did immoral things. You know, that was not supposed to be done in television. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they broke that. And, and to my mind, Seinfeld is still the greatest show ever made, whether it's sitcom or drama. I just worked with Michael Richards. It was on, on Cal- Kirstie Alley's new show. And yeah. He's, he's great in that, too. Brilliant. He's, he, yeah. You know, the, these, the, the actors were just absolutely brilliant. The yeah. writing was unbelievable, but primarily driven by Larry David, I think, his, because yeah. he, he introduced these these both plot and character elements. Yeah. But once that had happened, then he, then it was just basically repeat that. You know, Friends was a... Was a, a well, they, they, because the, 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 I remember, the, you know, pitching shows, I remember the idea was, well, do, are we going to want this guy in our living room every every, right. uh, every week? And is he likable? And, exactly. And, and so what you were doing was creating people that we all know likable but unlikable people. Right. I mean, my God, <laughs> most of my friends are not guys, I swear to God, my closest friends, I wouldn't set any of them up with my sister, <laughs> exactly. uh, you know, but, but I love them, but they're great guys. Yeah. And I'd way rather be around them than the dudes that hang, you know, with, you know, the, 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 the prototypical guy you'd want marrying your sister. I mean, right. And, and, but what, and what they found in both, in both te- uh, television and in film is that audiences actually like a character more if they have unlikable elements. In other words, if they do things wrong once right. in a while. Mm-hmm. That's right. By the way, I love, my, I love my brother-in-law is married to my sister. So if he's listening to that, that's, <laughs> He's actually, he's actually he's actually a, it is it, it, far from you know a, a straight laced guy, but anyway yeah yeah but you're right sorry I had to throw, I had to throw that in there I can see my I, brother I understand you you, you got to take care of family business no shit yeah. yeah exactly well, and it's also especially when you see his brother in law he's a Viking yeah so he's a Viking you know. and hey, <laughs> you know. he might kick my ass he's a yeah. stud but but, uh, but but anyway you know you, th- this happened with Seinfeld and then. And then so we've had this really fallow period afterwards of essentially repeating that model. Mm-hmm. Now, the, 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 the new stuff that's happening in the, in the, in the sitcom model is, is bringing, this, bringing serious drama into the sitcom form so that it's not just, as, as it has always been on network, how many jokes can you compress into a 22-minute period. Right. Uh, so you, you get things like Girls and Louie and so on. Um, but, you know, where they're really interesting is not in the sitcom, the funny areas, 
Uh, it's in how well they are mixing serious and comic moments, because that is a very difficult thing for writers to do. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Where does, where does South Park come in in all this? Well, South Park, I think, is, is you know, you look at animation in sitcom, some of the very best work in the history of sitcom has happened in animation, mm-hmm. uh, with, with not only South Park, with uh, Family Guy, and Simpsons. Family Guy, and of course The Simpsons, and so on. I mean, th- those things are brilliantly written, uh, and you know the the you, you with with animation you lose certain restrictions that you have with live action uh, that that allows them to be extremely creative. Mm. Um, and you know, we found from Pixar that just because it's animation doesn't mean it can't be great. I mean, that stuff's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I my mean, God. Like a fa- Finding Nemo, by the way. Wally. I just watched Finding Nemo again with, yeah. my, with my, my kids. That is a perfect movie. Yeah. I mean, right? I mean, uh, the, the, the way that's written, whoever wrote that. I mean, you know, but that I mean, well, that's, cause John probably worked on. But I mean, that's John. The thing. You probably doctored that. <laughs> well, I, I I wish I could tell you. Ah, you see that <laughs> plausible deniability. By the way, do you hear that? Do you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? Let it be known. Yeah. In my opinion, John truly worked on Finding Nemo. So no, no, I didn't say that. I yeah, know exactly. you didn't say it, but I went, boy, are you a good denialist, dude? I'm like, oh, but hey, I wish I could let, take credit. Yeah. Let me tell you, Brian. I wish I could take credit for it, but when you're talking about Pixar, you're talking about the studio with the best writing of any studio in Hollywood, and it's not even close. Well, it's here's incredible. the here's it's the incredible. interesting thing is, is you know I grew up uh, watching. I went through the golden age of Disney films, right? Yeah. They had The Lion King, Aladdin, you know, Beauty and the Beast, you sure. know, The Little Mermaid, and I mean there really was a period when they had it all figured out. And it seems like Disney lost that secret sauce, at least in their animated. Um, realm and yeah. you know Pixar is now going through that golden moment and you know may it last forever but you know what why is it that sometimes these things come together what do you think it is about John that? Truby yeah. John Truby gets into the door <laughs> <laughs> well John let me speak for you it's his book Brian, if they, if I'd they, love they, to hear what you have to say I was yeah. going to say they, if, they, if, they, if they read the anatomy of story <laughs> yeah, then, they wouldn't then, have lost yeah. it and the minute those writers stop writing reading the bible yeah. on writing which is the anatomy of story and I'm being dead serious. The whole freaking house collapses. Well, let, let, let me tell you, I could have, for the, for the anatomy of the story, I could have u- just used examples from Pixar films. Mm-hmm. The, whole, yeah. the whole book. Yeah. That's yeah. how good they are. Toy Story 3. Is brilliant. That, that was, the, I thought, the best movie of the year. Wow. That year. Without a doubt. Wow. The, the writing on that is so great. And, and, it's, and it's because they... They honor the writer in a, in a in a world that is all about the auteur, the you know director who is mm-hmm. the author of the film, which I I've always said is one of the dumbest ideas anybody ever came up. I with. agree with you on mm-hmm. that. It, it starts with the writer. It man. starts with the writer, yeah. and with at Pixar, they put tremendous emphasis on getting that writing great. And and you know going back to the the question about why is TV drama so great? Guess what? The writer controls the TV medium. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. The only story medium in America where the writer does control it. The same thing with plays, with good plays. So, yeah. do, you, so do you think that's it? Is is that it essentially, you know, probably? I mean, you know, this is all very hypothetical, but I mean, essentially, story works when you focus on the writing and you focus on the writer. Absolutely. Yeah. It, but, it, it's it's the only it, you have to, and and that doesn't mean that that you know. You you have to do the theater model where the individual writer is king, which mm-hmm. I'm, you know I'm, I'm very much unhealthy. in favor of. Yeah. But but the, what we've seen with television is where we get these these writers' rooms, these team writings, mm-hmm. um, can be every bit as good or better because mm-hmm. what they're doing, what they demand, and it's partly because of the extreme pressure that these guys write under time wise, but. They demand that every story is worked out beat for beat before they go to first draft. And this is huge. And it is, it is completely counter to the way most screenwriters work. And a, a lot of the advice that you hear thrown from towards writers is just write, dude. Just write. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's the biggest mistake you can make. Right. Well, and because yeah. what happens is you get this. It's by the way, it's one of the marks of an amateur. You get an idea. It's a great idea. You're so excited about it. You ju- you start writing script pages. 
Mm-hmm. You get 10, 15, 20 pages in, you write yourself into a dead end, you've just destroyed a great idea. Yeah. You have to, like in any art form, you have to do your prep work. Mm-hmm. You've got to build, if you're building a house, they always use that analogy, yeah. but it's so true. Yeah. You've got, you got to build your base. And well, you talk about the value of having a one-line outline. I mean, you've got to just, you've got to just outline this thing beat for beat and know where you're going. Exactly. And that's that's a really good model as well for life. The point is is that, you know, you can't just live. You have to take the time to really figure out what are you going to do. Well, I tell that, I, I say in. that to people. There is a methodology to, to educating yourself, to becoming an educated person. Academics actually do follow an outline. They do read the seminal thinkers first. They're, right. They're Right. I mean, there is a there is a way to pinpoint your your um, efforts in 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 the grand, broader effort of of educating yourself. There are things you must read because yeah. mm-hmm. other things spring from that. And exactly. It's like everything else in life, you know. Exactly. I mean, and, I, I, same thing with a sport. Learn the fundamentals. Learn right. The fundamentals. I mean, and one of the the big problems that the writers have now that, that just people have now is there's now so much emphasis put on the image that. People forget that to really get to the depths of who you are, you have to do it through the written word. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I firmly believe that. And, and because that's the only place where you can look to the deeper connections, the larger processes that Aristotle was talking about. In other words, in other, you're saying you, you have to be a reader, or, or what do you I, mean? I, I, you have to be a reader, and you have to be a writer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not just about, oh, well, I had this image, or I had this vision uh, that you know, of, of whatever it might be. In order to do some very deep work, in whether it's a character in a story or yourself in life, you have to write down the, and I talk about this in my memoir class, you have to write down the key plot events of your life Mm -hmm. and look at them as a whole. Get a sense of the pattern and then look for what were the patterns underneath those events. What were really determining them and what were what was determining the sequence of those events? Because that's the only way you can get to the causes. You're talking about for 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 like as a personal exercise. Exactly. And and when you say those moments, those seminal moments, you're talking about sort of the things that the, the, write down the things that you remember the most vividly that had the most emotional impact that kind of changed everything for you is that what you're saying and then look at why that happened what kind of led to that exactly mm-hmm. both both the seminal emotional moments and the seminal decision points because those are where you're going to get the moral quality of what has happened in your life i think about it all the time yeah, yeah. i really do i would have been i remember I remember when I was 14 years old and I almost didn't wrestle. I almost mm. signed up for the jogging class. <laughs> yeah. And my life would have been very different. Yeah. I wouldn't have as well, – first of all, I have a beautiful body. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Speaking about, about reading the Greeks, I'm yeah, looking I mean, at the Greeks. Reading, yeah, reading the Greeks, I'm looking at myself. Yeah. Uh, no, but it's funny how everything is – my buddy was a pro fighter and I've always been fascinated with, with sort of combat sports. And he comes over and, and I had done my, my share of, you know, I've been on a mat and, you know, in a ring and all. And he, he comes over and he, he's a pro. And he, he's gonna, he said, well, we'll hit mitts. We'll work on, I'll teach you some boxing stuff. I go, yeah, all right, fine. You know, I can't wait to show this guy how I hit mitts, right? So he shows up with sticks. And I go, well, I don't want to learn stick fighting. It's not stick fighting, you idiot. I'm going to teach you how to stand. You have no idea. You, you know nothing about footwork. <laughs> I go, I know, but I can hit. He goes, yeah, everybody can hit mitts. You want to show me how you can really hit mitts, huh? That's great. That, that, it's all about where you punch from and right. how you move my friend you're right. a you're a target and and he was so he literally had me punching him and he was catching my punches with his forehead really? and, and i was like oh i can't do this because my hands are going to break so you can kick my ass without throwing a punch <laughs> so so you know what sensei i'll give it over to you and, that, and, and that's that is that's life right yeah. N- nowhere to punch from nowhere to write from now are you are, yeah i mean that's the real extended metaphor right is, is yeah. the point is is that it's knowing how to stand that's what we're talking about you have to be clear on what you believe in Your so that base. you can stand yeah There's exactly a base. I mean, it, it's a perfect example in the sense that when when people look at boxing they're looking at the punches that are thrown yeah they don't look under the surface to see the real process which is the base the power mm-hmm. base that those punches yeah. have to come from. footwork it's that's all right. that's footwork. right i mean I, right. I i did a lot of coaching and in fact i was heavily influenced in writing this book 
from the coaching work that I did when I was much younger. I, my my sports were racket sports. Oh wow! Although I did wrestle one season when I was fourteen. <laughs> we have and, a lot in common, my friend. Yes, we do, and it was the most difficult sport I ever. Play. It's a uh, nightmare. It's oh, a nightmare. it's brutal. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. always say that to people. I was like, well, when you horseback ride, you use every single muscle in your body. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah? Come roll on a mat yeah. with me, my friend. See yeah. what happens yeah. to your life. Yeah. Try try six minutes oh. of wrestling, oh. and, and then, you will. they will have to drag you off the mat. Exactly. It's so painful. And in college, it's nine minutes. It's freestyle. Nine, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's a nightmare. <laughs> no, there's, but, there's no doubt. But anyway, the... the the you know sports was a tremendously important thing for me again because you know you, it's been said that the coaches are the the best teachers in a school because mm-hmm. they have to teach for results yeah and yep. they have to be very practical yep and so but 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 in coaching too it's all about getting to what really determines the success of what you're doing you know John I was taught to concentrate by the people in my life when I was younger and they, they they would use very strong active metaphors you got to concentrate I mean it was all this idea of like you got to concentrate like your life depends on it grit your teeth and just uh, and get down there and concentrate <laughs> and I I just could never apply that yeah and and then I had a uh, um, a taekwondo teacher a boxing coach who said to me um yeah, throw throw a throw a jab, and I was teaching me how to just jab, and and I threw the jab, and he said, did you, did you think about that? I said, no. He said, just just did it, and I said, yeah. He goes, read the same way, read with the exact same mindset, <laughs> and I went, what, <laughs> what? This, but I thought I was supposed to use incredible effort. I thought yeah. I was supposed to have sweat coming down my, you know, that mm-hmm. that that's the that's and Hunter wrote a great book called The Straight A Conspiracy about this, the notion that the the worst, the, it, actually, you have a lot in common. With, uh, J- Hunter wrote a book. Uh, John, that's doing very well now called The Straight of Conspiracy, and it's about how the worst idea we are born with was is the notion, the worst idea in the world is that people are born smart. Mm. Uh, because it 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 really is a question of the the emotional context in which you arrive at something, and that's how you learn. And and yes, you can be very talented and smart, I suppose, but it's not going to help you write a great screenplay until no. you understand and master the craft over exactly. years. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and I have found this... Uh, Years and years and years of experience, which is the people that I have found who work professionally in the entertainment business are not the most naturally talented writers. Mm-hmm. I, I've, I see that again and again. It is the writers who have committed themselves to mastering the craft. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so a producer goes to them and they know they're going to get a professional product because these people are craftsmen and they're going to do the job. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There and, you go. I mean, you know, I've had the privilege of knowing uh, Ed Solomon over the last six months, mm-hmm. and, you know, he was, uh, he wrote Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, which you want to talk about, like, it's so funny because you're in Hollywood and, you know, you see all these people, celebrities and all that sort of stuff, never really being excited by any of them. But when I found out, oh, my God, you're the guy who wrote Bill and Ted's Excellent <laughs> right. Adventure, right. you know. Um, but, you know, he did Men in Black. He's done a bunch of things. But oh, yeah, he's you, a hell of a writer. Yeah, and you want to talk about a craftsman. I mean, you know, he writes these very fun, family-friendly movies. Yeah. But, you know, he really thinks every aspect of it through and is constantly – I mean, it really is. It's him with a block well, of marble I mean, just chipping away yeah, at yeah. it. Todd Phillips took a script of mine that I wrote with Anthony Tambakis, who wrote the movie Warrior and stuff. And, and Todd took a script that we wrote, and he gave me notes on it. And, you know, Todd, obviously the author of The Hangover and Hangover 2 and yeah. Old School and stuff. And, man, uh, you know, we've been friends a long time, and I always thought Todd made these comedies, and he was just really good at The notes I got from him were just, this is a guy who really understands how a movie works. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, yeah. It, 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 but, well, the thing is, John, your book, I, I just feel, and I, this is maybe, I, I don't know how you'd write a screenplay without it. I mean, these people... The, the the good writers, whether they're Alan Ball or whoever, they 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 understand a lot of what you talk about in mm-hmm. in your book. Yeah, but they haven't read your book. So, my question is, where the hell did they learn it? <laughs> well, you know, a lot of it is, first of all, certain people. When we say that they are naturally talented, what we mean is that they have a natural sense of drama, mm-hmm. how it works, how you set it up, and how you build it, and how you pay it off. Mm. Now, one of the things that I tried to do in my book is to put names to these elements so that people would have a better chance to be able to repeat it. 
mm-hmm. uh, and know, and and they would be able to do what is the most difficult thing to do, which is to rewrite yourself. Yeah. Because that that's a contradiction in terms. You did everything you thought was the right way to do it when you wrote the first draft. Mm-hmm. Now you have to look at your own work, figure out what you did wrong, and then fix it. Mm-hmm. Almost impossible. And this oh, is why, and this always shocks people when I tell them this. For most writers, the second draft is worse than the first. Yeah. <laughs> and they think, I'm the only guy who made that mistake. But it's incredibly yeah. depressing. Yeah. So, but, but again, it goes, it, it goes to understanding the craft elements. And I guarantee you, these other writers, they may not use the terms that I use, but they have a very highly worked out, very detailed process that that is pr- focused almost totally on getting the structure right because screenplays and and teleplays are all about structure they are the closest mediums to pure story that we have and p- pure story meaning just the structure beats well i mean you know k anders erickson who's the guy who has popularized the 10,000 hour rule and studies yeah. expertise you know he, there's this great volume that he edits called the cambridge handbook of expertise it's really great and mm-hmm. it's basically all of the papers on it and what you find again and again and again is that experts in these fields use the same mental shortcuts yeah. they don't recognize that they're using the same mental shortcuts but it's the same mental shortcuts that are being used again and again and i think that's one of the really interesting things that's happening now and that's really going to explode the, the quality of work that we're seeing is there are people like you who are formalizing what are the mental shortcuts that are needed for a particular craft exactly. and once you've got that taxonomy there that anybody can read it really speeds up the learning process and yeah i mean there's just going to be much more of a aha, it's not that it's a lightning bolt from Zeus. Right, right? exactly. It's, it's when did process. you release the book, John? I believe it was 2006. And how is it done? It's done extremely well. In yeah. fact, we just got, just got uh, a request from Russia for a Russian translation. Um, we've got a, just, just, uh, we're in the process of doing a China cha- uh, Chinese translation. and uh, it, It's unbelievable. It, it, it is a worldwide phenomenon. It yeah, well, just, it should be. It should be. I mean, it's, it's, it's got to be so satisfying to read. I mean, you must have known, though. I mean, uh, has, has the success of the book been a surprise, or did you kind of know that you were writing well, something? Well, that... you know, I've been, I've been teaching courses in story for over 25 years, and, wow. and uh, I have probably a, a stack as, as long as, as my arm of people who have written letters saying, you changed my life because I was doing, the, doing it the old way. So I'm not the first guy? This is outrageous. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Damn it, John. You said it the best, but, um, <laughs> yeah. but no. I, I, you know, it, it, and it's because it, it, this is fundamental to people's lives. And mm-hmm. so if you can give them a set of tools that allow them to express that and do it at a level that they're not embarrassed by, it's it's a huge thing. You know, I, you know writing man, is so it, it is such a transformative I, I experience. Gotta, yeah, I got to tell you, you know, for me, I was thinking about this this weekend. I, I, not to be, but my stand up is at this point. You know, I'm about to shoot my second hour, and I, I, I'm I, I'm as, I'm surprised. I'm as, I've I've realized my goal in a lot of ways as a comic. I mm-hmm. have to say, so it's been very immensely satisfying, and and I, I I continue to do it. I'll do it the rest of my life. But I I, I have to say that. The one thing I've never been able to do is write a good screenplay, and and your book showed me why. And it's so exciting for me to have now a book I can reference and continue to study, uh, because for the rest of my life, I'm going to try to write a really good screenplay. I hope, I don't know when it's going to be, I hope I hear someday from you and say, hey, Brian, <laughs> read your screenplay, saw your movie. Outstanding work. <laughs> I mean, well, I, I have no doubt that you'll do it. I really do, because you, 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 you're taking the right approach. I um, appreciate you, it. You're, you're focusing on getting those craft elements down, and, and really what you're trying to do is, is very difficult. You're going from a, a, an art form stand-up Mm-hmm. which has a totally different length in terms of setup and payoff mm-hmm. from a screenplay or a novel. That's right. So it's it's a very big jump you're trying to make, but you're doing it the right way. Well, my heroes have always been writers. You know, uh, people say, well, who are your comedic heroes? None. Never watched comedy. Didn't <laughs> yeah. care. It was, yeah. always came natural for me. I was always the guy who made people laugh in a room. I just had a natural sense for it. It was that I grew up overseas my whole life, and I the way I'd get people to like me was I'd come in and go, hey, guys, I can play sports. Sports and look at me, yeah, you know. Right. 
right. mm-hmm. and you learn. I think my my I, I had I was always using people and practicing. And by the time I actually got up on stage when I was twenty three or whatever, I. I was like, this is this feels just as natural yeah. as my living room, mm-hmm. you know. Sure. But but the 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 other side of it is obviously, you know, the, the people that wrote who can, you know, I mean, if you really think about the great novelists, by the way, I mean, like uh, just any, it, there are so many examples of people who, like Faulkner. I remember reading Faulkner for the first time, and he's hard to get through. Yeah, and he's not a, even a good example necessarily. But I was like, oh, first of all, first of all, I'm not. I'm not writing because I've mm-hmm. got nothing to say. <laughs> Let's start there. It's been done by the giant, yeah. you know. And but some of those guys are ch- like, I mean, they're just they're just awe inspiring. I mean, yeah. who, who's the writer that kind of floors you, the novelist? Well, you know, I, I mean, to me, in terms of putting together something that is both <clears throat> profound as well as pleasing, mm. uh, I, I don't know how you beat Dickens. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. And 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 in a funny way, Dickens is the model for all the great television that's being written right now. Yeah, well, the characters in like yeah. the are Pickwick amazing. Papers, yeah, yeah, yeah. the characters are beyond yeah. Yeah. anything you can imagine. I always say to people, if you if you read Dickens, listen to him. Ha- get a book on tape, mm-hmm. yes. and have an actor read it because mm-hmm. you know you're the, the other the other pe- person I tell is if if you le- read Nabokov, you read Lolita, if you read Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy, have somebody read that shit to you. Yeah. Well, don't, and especially don't with Lolita, Jeremy Irons reading Lolita oh, is incredible. Forget it. I mean, have, you, know. have you listened to that, John? I have not. That's, that's great. Oh, I'm going to check that out. You, you, it's it, so when good. you're driving in your car, just download yeah. download that book with Jeremy it, Irons. It's just, it's, he does such a perfect job. I mean, I think the, the, the joy of Lolita is, is that you're never sure how to feel about Humbert. Yeah. Well, but you that's a classic I mean? example that's, of a guy does, who made a pedophile sympathetic. Yeah. Right, right. So. Goes against every convention of of writing, especially writing in in you know popular film and television mm-hmm. that that you could possibly do. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. and each, and it, it's just I mean with the with the Jeremy Irons performance, it really just is always like you know it's never one way or the other. You know yeah. what I mean? You really never know how to feel about the guy. Yeah, that's right. Um, John, I know you live in uh, you live out in, near the beach. I think somewhere in the Malibu area. But um, I uh, I will invite you to my stand up if I'm when I come off tour. You got to come out to Hollywood. I would one love night. to come to your stand up. Let's grab a drink. I'll make you laugh. And uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, man. You're, my you're pleasure, awesome. Brian. Uh, guys, it's been a total treat. Uh, I, I love the depth that you're going uh, on your show. It's just uh, it's a pleasure to be on with well, you. Well, you're you're a big part of people like you are a big part of making it so uh, so pleasurable. And uh, what do you have another book in mind, or are you just going to stick to to making movies better I'm, I'm in this world? Actually, I'm actually focused pretty much on, interestingly enough, uh, just in the last year, shifting a lot over to a TV drama. It, it, it's it's nice. because that's where the great stuff is is happening. Yep. And yep. Uh, I'm now I'm now getting requests from. South America, Europe, Australia, they, they come and tell us, give us some insight about how we can do TV drama. Sensei Truby. Yeah, it comes as close <laughs> as, as you guys are doing in uh, in the U.S. So I love it. It's it's really exciting time. I love it, man. Well, you deserve it. You're a special dude. We really, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, and John. That, Talk to you soon. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. He's greatest, man. Yeah, and I would also just really say, you know, even if you're not a, a writer or a storyteller or anything like yeah. that, I mean, you are a storyteller because we all are, but, uh, you know, reading books like this is so helpful in yeah. terms of forcing you to really think about who you are, what you're about. It is. It's a, it's, it's a manual for life. It that's really, right. you read You read his book and you really will get a sense of, uh, that's exactly right. Uh, I mean, I wish I'd read this book when I was younger. Absolutely. You, you get a real sense of, the, the how to tackle this problem called being a human being mm-hmm. you know that that guy is and he's so interesting how clear he is as a, as well, a speaker and the book is so accessible i mean it's so yeah. you know i mean it's so it's, it's a great book. it's so clearly written it's a great book and you notice how he would speak make a point and just stop mm-hmm. like his mind is so well organized yeah you know um anyway uh, which fantastic. i think that i mean that's that's what writing forces you to do yeah you know what i mean yeah, I mean, obviously. Well, I, that's what it is, right? You yeah. got to be really specific about what you're trying to say because you have exactly. a limited amount of time on the page. Well, and you know, have you ever read Elements of Style? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the, that whole book, yep. which is the classic book on writing yep. in general, you know, it all comes down to three words: omit, 
needless words. Yeah, man. And yeah. that is that is what writing What's that, that is famous. What... Who was it? Maybe it was uh, Proust who said, "I'm sorry that this uh, letter is so long. I didn't have time, time to, to write, write a, a short shorter one. one." Yeah, it was Pascal. Pascal. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank no you. worries. Pascal. No worry. Proust. Somebody with a P from <laughs> yeah, France. Yeah, because let me tell you, if there was one man who did not omit needless words, it, it yeah. was Proust. <laughs> he, I, have you ever read Remembrance of Things Bad? It is so I can't long. Do it. I mean, some of it's actually brilliant. There was a book that came out recently that about Proust was a neuroscientist, just about all of the fact that the insights that Proust ha- had, because he had reflected so deeply on his own experience, yeah. that he'd actually managed just anecdotally to figure out an incredible amount of neuroscience. Yeah, he'd go himself yeah. <laughs> life is too short to fucking read proust or learn german <laughs> even though you speak german all right man that's uh, that's this is Counts, uh, 100 miles. Uh, <laughs> you've been listening to the brian callen show be sure to visit brian for information about this episode as well as past and future episodes you can follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Callen and like him on Facebook. Go to Facebook.com slash Brian Callen Comedy. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.